My name is Bernard Sweeney and I'm an Irish traveller and I'm located here in Dublin at the moment. We're doing a podcast with my good friend Dylan Foley, archaeologist, historian and a few different other disciplines in there. And we're also joined with Jim Wilson from Scotland and Jim is a scientist and scientist knows everything about any scientific issue you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, and he's also working on a wonderful project, um, the Scottish um, Travellers Genetic History Project. And Jim's going to tell us a, a bit about that in a moment. But I'm going to let the two people introduce themselves first so people get a better uh, understanding who we're talking to. Jim, over to you, my friend. Thank you, uh, Bernard. Um, yep, so I'm Jim Wilson. And uh, as you can hear, I'm Scottish. And uh, I study DNA. I study genes. And uh, I've spent the last 20 years of my life um, studying Scottish populations, uh, mostly populations from the Northern Islands of Scotland, where I come from, uh, but also other uh, Scottish populations, trying to understand um, their DNA. What does it tell us about the past? And maybe it will tell us something about our personal futures. Um, how does it put us at risk uh, of diseases? And how do the different populations of Scotland differ. And just recently, I was invited by a group of Scottish travellers to set up a study called Traveller Genes to, to ask these kinds of questions about the Scottish travellers because they've never been studied before. So we're working together to try to, to learn a bit more and get this study going. And you've broadened that just a little bit. You've also included Irish travellers. Yep, um, the Scottish travellers are very interested to know if they are related to the Irish travellers, and if so, how they are related. So we'd really like to recruit um, some volunteers from the Irish traveller community. We have done some work, myself and my colleagues from RCSI uh, on the, in Dublin, on the Irish travellers in the past, but we'd like to be able to include Irish travellers in this new study. It's got a, a little bit of a health aspect to it that we didn't have in, in the old study. And uh, just to be able to ask the question of whether there are links, we want to see, obviously, how the travellers are related to the settled people, whether there's any influence of the Romani people in the Scottish travellers, but very importantly, uh, whether there are links with Irish travellers. And so we'd be very keen to have um, some Irish travellers volunteer um, to take part to allow us to, to look at these questions. Just on that, because uh, genetics, Almost everything and everyone has a genetic code. Is it like a fingerprint, a special unique code to each person? Yeah, I mean, how do I explain it? Genetics, DNA, it's like a blueprint for life. It's like the blueprint that you build, not a building from, but this body, your body. And it's also the instruction manual for how to run it. It's all down at the level of molecules and, and cells, but that's what's going on. It's the master uh, blueprint of instructions and every one of us has DNA, all animals, all plants, most microorgan, all microorganisms. Um, and so depending on which species you are, it has a, a different blueprint. And within humans, we're all almost identical. We're more than 99.9% .9 identical in our DNA, but we've got a huge amount of DNA. So even this tiny proportion that's different amounts to actually, so Bernard, you and me, probably about 4 million letters of DNA different from one another. So even, but that's because there's billions of letters all together. So it's a small proportion, but I'm interested in what, what that means. Most of them will have no meaning at all, no influence whatsoever, but some of them might be important. They might put me at risk of cancer or you at risk of heart disease or who knows what. And uh, it, it's about understanding these things. One of the confusions I think uh, some people get and I found in time is that when we talk about genetics, like what people might have talked in the past about the, the Gaelic genetics, uh, who are the Gaelic people? And then we come to realize that actually Gaelic or religion or politics has nothing to do with genetics at all, that these are concepts from the human mind. And you could be from any genetics in any culture, in any language, in any situation. So it's a case that I think with travelers, we're not saying that travelers are genetically coded uh, different from settled people. We know we're connected, related to all humans. We get that part. Is it, So it's down to genetic uh, markers, down to like a diversion that is split in the population. Is that what you're kind of searching for? Yeah, I mean, we're all one large human family. We all descend from the same ancestors way back in time. 
in fact, everyone on Earth, most of their ancestry comes from Africa um, about 60,000 um, years ago. So we all interrelate uh, in many different ways, but it's still interesting to focus down when people are interested in the, in the more recent past and in the heritage of their own community and in their origins and their ancestry, where they come from. Uh, particularly if there's not a huge amount of, of written records, this can be important for people. It's an age old interest. Where's my family from? Where, where did we come from? What, what, what were we doing? So I think it, it taps into this innate sense that people have a wonder uh, about the past. And so DNA can teach you about the past and at the same time might be important for, for your health as well. I'll go over to Dylan because obviously we took a good interest in the whole genetics when it came up um, because we found it fascinating, of course, like everybody else, people who are now being told that your ancestors goes back centuries, if not thousands of years on the island. So that came to a very kind of, um, it helped the whole structure a lot more of uh, what Dylan was working on anywhere, the, the colonization and the history. So I'll just get over to Dylan. Dylan can tell us a bit about Seth and how he might have found the Irish DNA project useful and helpful. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, I'm uh, Dylan Foley. I'm an archaeologist. Well, I was a field archaeologist for a long time. I'm sort of moving sideways with that career, but I work on a project with Bernard for quite a few years now where, we're, where we work alongside, well, with various people, and but me and him as well, to uh, work with them. Um, in dealing with some of the more historical, uh, some historic, well, so you can, uh, working with other people and seeking so we work on a history, so sorting out the history uh, of, of um, well, of Ireland. How do I put this? Sorry, I've confused myself here. We're trying to sort oh, out about, we're, sort, we're trying to sort out about 20 things at once. And I work with Bernard alongside trying to do that. One of, one of the things that we would have noticed is that Genetics, for example, uh, and science of genetics has revolutionized in archaeology over the last so many years. So we spend a lot of time trying to sort of keep up even with um, what it what the results are from uh, genetic studies of populations and where they where they came from or moved to and all that kind of thing. Obviously, we have smaller versions in, in Ireland where uh, population studies have been done. And some of the work I was doing was to try and see, can we add when, when we, how the, re, the results we get from genetics are one thing, and maybe Jim can talk about that, but when we add them with arch, we, we looking at it from a depth of time perspective, like archaeology does, we're also looking for, uh, can we put them in context or can we say what was happening at a certain time or does it mean something that makes sense to us about the population history within Ireland? And also, you know, and, and the other way around, the archaeology can point to things that are, uh, genetics might test or look for or give us some clues about. Uh, what you were referring to, Bernard, was, was it, studies were done here back in 2011. Um, and I think in two, 2017, a paper came out as well um, with uh, GM Piero Cavalieri and the Royal College of Surgeons and a few other people. I think Jim might have been involved as well. The um, uh, And... Uh, those studies we found very interesting and very uh, with, with very good information, but maybe uh, what was lacking here and uh, would be, would have been the historical aspect um, of understanding what the new information really means. And I suppose it takes a little while for us to sort of sort through that, both with historic in a historical sense and with the communities that are involved themselves. I think what sparked our interest also, I think, is when the scientists said there had been a divergent, a divergence, say, in the markers 360 years ago. And we can see other markers then, say, from 1,000 years ago. So that was the part we got. We're saying, like, well, did something happen at that time? Was there a reason for the divergence? So this is oh. where I think... Well, let's go over to Dylan again because this is where so the history part. Yeah, so we, we, some of the project we've been doing in the last couple of years, of course, has been that... Uh, how it's reported, well, the history itself in Ireland, obviously the genetics, the studies have um, <clears throat> ramifications. Uh, for a long time, it's been, uh, since at least the 50s, it was on, it was, it's been claimed or understood that we wouldn't, uh, that the po traveler population in Ireland was um, nomadic or not, some people argued not Irish and other people argued connected to Romas and others uh, said they were Irish and that, and, and just, or, or 
dislocated by the famine and various other types of history like this. But always behind it, as we would have pointed out, that there's been an assumption that the settled population was the normal population in the country or the predominant normal way of life for many centuries and that travelers were the um, were the aberration, if you know what I mean. And this was the standard up until these studies were done recently. And of course, work with me and Bernard work on predominantly is actually trying to overturn that. And it's interesting to us in the sense that genetics actually gives us a base to do that from. Um, because Ireland was colonized, as we know, and, it, and, it, and that has still has effects now in, in kind of what the historical narrative is and how it's told. But thanks to the genetic studies, we realized when we seen this study saying that the traveler population in Ireland was uh, from an ancestral population, the same as the settled population uh, in general, that this allowed it, even just that simple fact would allow us to move forward and understand uh, the history uh, better. That give us a ground in that, uh, okay, A, Irish, B, we have a divergence at about 400 years ago, um, according to that study in 2017, and we would know then that this would lead to the 16th century uh, dislocation of Gaelic culture at that time. So that's kind of what we're in, involved in, trying to piece that together and explore it. Yeah, yeah um, and I think it's pretty much trying to put the framework or even a narrative or context with the signs, because one thing talking about history, it's very vast and vague and it can go on forever. Like there's endless variables in one topic of history, let alone trying to sort out centuries of it. But at least when the science came along, and this is after years of bombardment and institutionalization by the state, uh, denying travelers their culture and their identity, telling them that they were a subculture and they were this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. But at least with the science, it gives us a code. It gives us to say, OK, well, you guys are actually on the island a very long time. Some of you have been here thousands of years. So I was going to ask you, Jim, do you remember anything much about the, the Irish one? And then we, of course, go on to the Scottish one. Yeah, um, I was uh, involved in a number of studies, um, the Irish traveller study and of uh, some of Irish settled people. I think, I think it's a very important discovery to see clearly that the Irish travellers had Irish roots. So I, I'm going to explain that a little bit for a second, because I think it's important to understand. There's one thing first is that this estimation of the time of divergence comes with quite a wide confidence so our best estimate was 360 years, but it, it, it may be longer. I personally think it could well be longer, but that's not how long the traveler lineages have been in Ireland. The traveler lineages that we saw, many of them were about 4,000 years old, and they had been in Ireland for that long, just the same as the settled people's lineages have been in Ireland typically that long. People, the public, don't, I think, have a very broad understanding of history as a whole. History is always about uh, the Norman conquest and, and all of these quite recent things. The biggest event ever in, in, in Irish history was a huge immigration of people 4,000 years ago in the Bronze Age that you're never taught about at school, probably because they didn't know about it so much back then. But the, the revolution in genetics that comes from skeletons, ancient DNA, has shown that there was probably a 90% replacement of the people in Ireland and in Britain, uh, roughly speaking 4,000 years long ago in, in the Bronze Age. These are people who had bows and arrows. They had axes. And I think there was probably violence. They, they were able to take over to such a degree the Stone Age people who, who were there before. So that's where the majority of the roots of Scottish people, of, of the settled Irish people and of the Irish travellers go back all that way. Then at some point, they did stop interbreeding with one another. And that's where this 360 year figure or 400 or, or, or a bit more comes from. And that's a harder one. And we actually need more samples, more studies to, to try to pin that down. Because I realize that's a critical thing that people want to understand too. But I just wanted to emphasize, not to completely get hung up on this 400 year uh, value when there's actually 4,000 years of history of the ancestors of the lineages of the Irish travelers in the island of Ireland, just the same length of time as you see for, for the settled um, people. So I, I just wanted to clarify that, that point for people in case it's interesting. 
I wonder is this, uh, I think this is where I'd be coming from and we're trying to work it out. So say today we're called Irish Travellers and a bit like a, a genetic code, but this is more like a label code. So they called us Irish Travellers and prior to that they called us Tinkers. And prior to that it was vagrants or right, um, Roman, or not really, uh, wanderers and hedge peoples and bogs people and woods people. We always seem to have a label going back, going back, going back, as far as written history can show us. But then we're going to get kind of mind boggled because there's a lot of Irish people with the same surnames as ourselves. And we're kind of thinking and wondering, how can they be the settled popular, settled culture and we're this Traver culture that they, so they somehow or another are the Irish culture and we're meant to be something else. So we're just thinking of throughout history and our own culture, we always knew that we carried a lot of culture and traditions with us. Like even today, even in my lifetime, there was chieftains, kings, queens, warriors. Our right, grand uncle was our great king and other clans had their kings. So this wasn't the kind of a, a childhood school kind of thing. This was real life stuff. This is what we believe. This is our, our channel, our frequency. So if we were called all these labels, then somebody else had to put these labels on us. Like for me to me and you to be you, there has to be two. So if there's a travelers, what's in contrast of that? So today we say settled people. But when we go to look for the settled people identity and label and language and tradition, we run into a kind of a stumbling block around the 1600s. Because prior to that, it was a Gaelic culture, one that we would still be practicing. But the settled people today are practicing a different culture that is very similar to England. So I just go over to Dylan on that. Maybe he'd like to fill in some blanks on that. If, yeah, well, it, we'll it's wipe very, it all off. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's great. It's good. It's very interesting. I mean, what what Jim is saying there is perf uh, perfect sense, obviously, from our right, point of view, even in archaeology records. And I mean, it's it's great to have it confirmed the sense that we we would now know. And I, I remember. Uh, those fa uh, fascinating uh, genetic tests uh, showing that there's um, that most of the people here population descended from the Bronze Age population, as as as, as you would call it. And we know about um, big movements of what we would suspect of being uh, Indo-European people off the steppe at that time, uh, westward with their horses and uh, or well, we're not. We think they may have had horses. I've seen other things now saying that we're not so sure, but. Uh, beakers and horses and metalwork and things like this that arrive into the country at that time, and um, so we're, we're 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 following that culture all the way through in Ireland, where where we would understand that this develops when it gets to historical records, develops to be a what we the majority culture on the island, which is Gaelic. We're we're never conquered by Rome. That continues. We have various invasions, obviously, of Normans and Vikings and things like this that establish some towns, but don't really change the Gaelic culture right up till, and that's the. This would be the point that we're interested that I don't want to focus on completely, but a little bit in the sense that bit that you're asking about, Bernard, where we go up to the 17th, the 16th and 17th century in Ireland is, is, is a kind of another pivotal moment because it's where we have a, a large population uh, alteration of maybe not of genetics of the population, but uh, in the in cultural in a cultural thing that wouldn't necessarily well it actually does show up in genetics to some extent we're seeing now. Um, but um, isn't so obvious uh, because it's mainly a cultural shift to do with the Elizabethan conquest um, of Ireland. And uh, as, you, as you were pointing out, we, the genetics now allows us, knowing that the two populations have the same base or on the island the same amount of time, we, now, uh, we know now that whatever happened in 17th century, we can make some sense out of it from the history in the sense that the, the assumption basically uh, that has been a lot of people had in the state, uh, in the Irish state in the last 50, 60 years or more, um, that the um, the assumption that this, what we call settled Irish or some was the normal way that everybody lived is actually turns out to be probably, we've, we've not really had it the right way around. We've not emphasized it properly. And it sort of seems obvious when I'm going to say it now, but um, the, the, the settled mode of living is the one that's post-colonial, post that conquest, if you know what I mean, and one really that doesn't kick in in Ireland until after the famine, in fairness, um, in large parts of the country. And so as we track back, we would expect in history, with leaving aside even genetics for a minute, we would expect le uh, less and less of what we call settled Irish, uh, and they would be more and more confined to the towns, which are English merchant towns, like Dublin and Galway and places like this, and we would expect that most of the country will be living in uh, clan systems. 
um, in to, here's something I found on uh, the web. Oh Jesus! According to <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so in um, uh, in the Gaelic um, uh, mode, which is uh, in the clans, um, which which by their nature are um, dynastic and um, uh, uh, constrict their um, breeding, if you want to put it that way, between clans that are related and between in areas and things like this. Uh, din dynasties they are uh, very as we would talk about Bernard very similar to like uh, to Japanese kind of feudal Jesus. society um, and so uh, that in itself would mean that um, we would expect Irish uh, uh, Irish clans and that to have uh, uh, probably an interest in genetic pattern or discernible patterns anyway uh, that might actually be quite exclusive in certain groups even before the conquest if you know what I mean they would be separated, like maybe the dynasties in Connacht or dynasties that we'd expect. We'd expect these dynasties to be kind of separated, even genetically, if you know what I mean, a little bit, and maybe to be uh, provincial, uh, which are the big territories at the time. And, we, and also maybe, as we know from the history books that we could, and we haven't tested for these things, but uh, that um, they would intermarry with other dynastic warriors like Normans and people like this that we know happened in history books. And it might be interesting to see if can any of these things turn up in the Scottish studies um, as well, you know. I, can I raise a point? I think it's very interesting you both alluded to here, and a study that has yet to be done, but should be done uh, in Ireland and in Scotland. But let's think about Ireland. It's the, the mention of the surnames. So you have surnames among the travelers that are shared with the settled people. And I think this is a key thing uh, that we could use to learn more about when the two populations went their own way, because if the settled McDonough's and the traveling McDonough's have the same Y chromosome, so I should backtrack a bit. There's a piece of DNA uh, called the Y chromosome, and it's a big chunk of DNA, and only men have this, uh, this piece of DNA. It's, it's inherited from father to son to grandson, so on down the generations, like, like a, a coat of arms would be inherited down the generations in a, in a noble family. Um, and it changes a little bit each generation. So you can actually read the DNA and piece together a family tree uh, in the male line of, of Y chromosomes. You don't need to have paper records to do this. So it's a very powerful technique. And we could use that in large um, families, clans or otherwise, to see whether the people carrying the surname in the travelers and the people carrying the surname uh, in the settled people have the same Y chromosome. Did they originate from the same founder? Um, because we know roughly when uh, surnames arose. And if they do, it's telling us one thing. And if they don't, it's telling us another thing. If they don't, it's probably pushing the history of the travelers as a separate group further back in time. Whereas if the people with the different surnames, uh, if they're shared between the travelers and the settled, it's probably pushing the separation closer and nearer in time. You need a lot of sample, you need men, uh, you need multiple people with each surname. It, it's a big project, but it, it, it's not impossible to do. And I think it would be a very interesting one um, uh, to, to, to shed a new kind of light on, on this um, question about the split, the time of when the divergence. Yeah, that's what uh, Bernard, uh, if I could just say that, yeah, I think that that's actually, Ireland's very suited to it because we have very early surnames and we also, yeah. we, we actually have records too, going back uh, yeah, tenth, ninth surnames appearing in the tenth century um, and onward. So yeah, um, you you would actually have a lot of historical information even to to. Um, you can see on our side Jim, how how it's a, it's kind of a, an exciting project for ourselves, um, and I, even for the Scottish travellers who are thinking are we related to the Irish travellers, well, we're going to soon find out, of course. But it also gives a lot of strength to their situation is because of the fallout of colonization and it is because of a cultural clash. Um, like we're here today with settled people um, and we wouldn't know if there were settled people unless they told us where we were travelers. We wouldn't know where we were travelers unless they told us that they were the settled people. So for us, it's a very psychological thing. We're not really caught up in the genetics. We know we're related to bananas and everything. So we're not that really caught up with it. But uh, sorry, go back over to you, Dylan. Sorry about that. Oh, oh no, I was just going to ask further, ask further and say about the the history of Western Scotland. We'd expect as well to be in the Gaelic zone, I suppose, uh, uh, culturally uh, up to a certain point. So, are you 
I was going to ask you, Jim, there, are you expecting something similar? I mean, you don't, I know you don't, you're not going to set out with, you're not going to look for, you know, you're not going to have a pre-conclusion, if you know what I mean, but. Um, uh, yeah, so. Do you have obviously... Gaelic surnames? Do you have things like clues, the sim similar clues, I suppose? Uh, exactly. You, you use the clues you have, of course, but yeah. we keep an open mind. Um, yeah. So there's definitely very, very strong connections between Western Scotland and particularly Northern part uh, of, of Ireland in both directions. The Gaelic language, as we call it in Scotland, probably having come over um, from Ireland to, to Argyle, and then uh, a lot of plantation uh, happening in the other direction. So it's 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 very complex. And among Scottish travellers, some of them have names beginning with Mac, um, which you know are are of the sort of uh, Gaelic um, part of things, and others have surnames that are other kind of Scottish surnames. So I'd love to do the surname study in the in the Scottish travellers as well to see if the Scottish travellers, so the Stuart is a very common name and McPhee, uh, for instance, among Scottish travellers, are they related to the Stuarts um, and the McPhees who are, who are not um, travellers? There's many, many options. I, I wonder, the Scottish travellers are very keen uh, to find out where they come from. And I would imagine that they're Scottish, but we need to ask that question. Is it the same situation as happened in Ireland, that they're just a different branch that they've been in Scotland for thousands of years and at some point they separated out? Or is there some more influence of Romani uh, people? Or did they actually come from Ireland? Are they just Irish travellers who came to Scotland? Um, all of these things are possible and maybe some sort of mixture um, of, of, of these different things. So the, these are all the things we're looking at. Yes, we have to be careful. There's a fair old Irish influence in uh, Southwest Scotland. So you have to take, take care of that as well. But we also have lineages in Scotland that are a few thousand years old and they're quite specific to Scotland, just as you have lineages in Ireland that are quite specific. I mean, deeper in the past, they link together. The Scots and the Irish are related. Um, in fact, everyone in the British Isles and Ireland is, is related, but you, you can still pick out lineages that come from particular places. Wales also has its own bunch of lineages that, that are Welsh. We can start to tease these things apart these days um, with the power of modern genetics. Okay, well then tell us how is the Scottish project that you're started or you're involved with? That was requested by travellers themselves, wasn't it? By a group of Scottish travellers who had seen the work uh, that we've talked about with the Irish travellers and they wanted their own study. There'd never been a study of Scottish travellers before of any kind uh, looking at, at their genetics. And uh, so we um, established a group of people who'd help us with this, travellers, a public involvement panel. And I'm happy that Bernard joined us. Thank you to represent Ireland. And we talked a lot about this and we've gone through lots of uh, bureaucracy, ethics committees, governance, um, insurance, and so on to allow us to do it. And we now have a study um, which we've launched uh, last month. We want to identify the uh, origins of the Scottish travellers and how they're related. That's within themselves. There's Highland travellers, Lowland travellers, Borders gypsies. How do they relate to each other? How do they relate to the Scottish settled population? Also the big question, how do the Scottish travellers relate to the Irish travellers? And do any of them relate to the English gypsies as well as other populations across Europe? And finally, there's a, a disease aspect to it. And um, uh, the travellers were interested to sort of have a broad study of the overall patterns of health and disease. Do the Scottish travellers have genetic risk factors that increase their risk of, of diseases in the community? Small, um, populations that marry within the community sometimes have a different set of genetic risk factors from other communities and it's important possibly for the future to, to learn about that so that you know which screening programs would be appropriate and help with diagnosis of, of rare diseases and so on so we're, we're we're establishing all that and we've had a great response um we've got over 100 participants within the month it's a purely online study so it's very easy and we'd be very keen to have more irish travelers we have a small number, a handful have joined, but to allow us to explore any relationships between the Irish travellers and the Scottish travellers, uh, we would hope to have some more um, volunteers. It's a very simple process. Short questionnaire takes about 15 minutes, and then we send out a spit kit, so a saliva tube uh, that you provide a saliva sample into and post that back to Edinburgh. And uh, then we'll be able to do the analysis and try to find out the answers um, to some of these questions. Wow, that's quite a bit. <laughs> um, yeah. I just go into a little bit there with the genetics. Um, one, the health, the, the, the disease factors. 
Um, this would have been also, we've seen recently, travel genetics uh, would have shown to have a healthier bacteria than the settled population because of their lifestyle. And also there seemed to be something that there were uh, diseases within the settled population that travelers didn't have. Um, I yeah, think they well, come I, up in I, the... I, there's a famous one because cystic fibrosis is a very common and awful disease, common in Ireland and common in Scotland, but I believe it's quite a lot rarer or even absent in, in the travelers. So there's, there's different sides to it, yeah. I'm losing my reception bad here. What's going on? Ah. Sorry about that. Uh, it's just one of those um, signals. Um, but yeah, because I, I know sometimes when people listen in and they hear about genetics and they hear about diseases, and then, of course, we, we, we see it in Ireland. I'm sure we have in Scotland a lot of kind of right-wing type people that like to draw on that, to use it against people. We've seen it in the past how genetics can be used against people and all the issues that has caused. So I'm always trying to find that balance. Um, did you, was there a bit of a scare, uh, did you find, I found it here in Ireland with travellers, around because of the vaccinations, COVID-19, because of this political weight, anti-vax, as you call them. Um, and then I see a lot of travellers getting behind, yeah, almost questioning the whole genetic project. What's it for? What are they going to do with it? Now, some of them are legit concerns. They're not based on the COVID-19 alone. Some of them go back quite a bit and, like I said, have legit concerns. But there's been quite a bit of that in Ireland, I sensed. And I wonder, is it the same in Scotland? Well, I think it's a sensitive area, isn't it? And uh, I think some of these concerns actually arise from hundreds of years of, of racism and uh, of prejudice and the treatment of travellers by, by the settled population and, dare I say it, by the state. And so it, it breeds uh, a distrust of uh, institutions. And then we, so we have that, and then we have genetics, which has a, a mixed history, uh, let's say, particularly longer ago, where um, genetics was used for, for bad purposes. Um, and so you conflate these two things together where you've got a distrust of, of institutions and genetics thrown into the mix that I can see why some people, if they're not been, not had the purpose explained to them, may come, come to some conclusion that I wouldn't say is warranted. We are doing this study with travelers for travelers to their benefit eventually, both in understanding the past and perhaps being able to help a little bit with health um, in, in the future. So it's about me communicating as clearly as I can, um, what's, it's difficult these days. You get conspiracy theories that fly around the internet and Facebook and are very hard to control. Yeah. I think humans have a propensity to believe somehow or another in, 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 in things. Um, in the olden days, they believed in witchery, witches, and now they believe in anti-vax theories. You know, there's a whole psychology. I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> there's a whole thing that, that should be studied here, but it's up to us to do the best we can to communicate what we're doing, which is completely bona fide and for the benefit um, of the community, it has been through all the ethical regulations that the population at large don't know about ethics committees and all the high standards um, that we are held to. We're not allowed to do anything. You know, we have to have justifications for every single thing. There's incredible layers uh, of security with all of the data yeah, that we're holding and, and very strong rules about, about privacy. So my conscience is very clear that we're doing this for the right reasons to help people. And I'd be happy to speak to anybody who, who is worried um, about these things. It, it's just mis unfortunate sometimes that I, I think rumors essentially uh, that are unfounded um, get, get spread around the internet, but that, that's the way, the way of the world. Well, just as, just as important as we found the one, and I personally found the one in Ireland um, almost life-saving because it changed my whole way of thinking. Because like I said, when you're bombarded all your life as a community, as an individual, and you're told you came from there or here or someone else, and you're not this, you're not that, you're something else. Um, then the genetics comes along with this project, fun project. And then we will say, yeah, actually we are from the island. 
actually now there seems to be markers that had also had historical events that almost went with them, that which might explain some of the story. Uh, <laughs> but um, the other thing I was going to mention to you, because I found this when I, when I was registering myself on the website, I came into the questions of parents and I don't know, middle names, their date of births, and then I was asking for the grandparents' date of births. And I, I, just, I just put in some of them, 1920, 1920, I, I guess some of them. Because one, I didn't want to go burden my father asking him about details uh, from people that left the world in tragic circumstances. And I know a lot of travelers are like that. They don't want to go and be bringing up people's names and dates of birth in this kind of way to find out who they are. Um, and the other thing was that it, it seems to be, you, you, it's restricted to all parents and grandparents must be travelers, or has that changed? No, it's not everyone. Uh, we um, need people to have at least two traveler grandparents. So two, you've got four grandparents, at least two of them should be travelers, two or more. So that usually means one of your parents is a traveler. We're very happy to have people with both parents travelers, all four grandparents or even three grandparents travelers but if it gets less than that it's really too dilute if you've only got one traveler grandparent and three grandparents who are settled people the the, the blood has become so dilute that it's, it's difficult for us to to study it so we, we're, we're looking for people who are half travelers or fully um travelers to to join and i i i take your point many people um, don't know the names or dates of, of their grandparents or there are maybe particular circumstances that uh, mean they don't feel they, they can ask or some people have nobody left to ask. Um, uh, but it's just, if you know it, to, to put it down. And if you don't, it's fine. It, it just helps us to see which who's related to whom or if, whether there's clusters of people with similar names. And if we don't have the information, we can live without it. But it's just to put down what you have. Most people know their mum and dad's name at least. And even if you know one granny, you know, who lived to be 90 and, and you knew and the other granny died before you were born, well, you're going to know more about the one than the other. That's that's completely yeah. okay. It's just you can leave it blank and, and skip forward uh, in the questions. But they're quite standard in genetics. Just, I mean, if two people have the same granny, that's useful for us to know. And what reassured and I know you just talk about the regulations and the high standard of code of conduct and the science behind and all this but what reassurance could you give to people that this project is what it says it is and nothing any less or more? Well research in Britain uh, has laws behind it and they're, they're governed by these research ethics committees who are independent bodies that exist to look after the, the welfare of volunteers um, and so we had to submit everything, every document, the website wording, the consent form, the questionnaire, the protocol, the document that describes what we're going to do, everything, hundreds of pages to this committee for scrutiny. Um, and so they then give us the green light legally to, to go ahead. So we've been through this entire process. We had a separate process of scrutiny from the University of Edinburgh itself, where I work. So they wouldn't allow me to do the work till they had done their own due diligence. Um, so we've been through multiple layers of uh, scrutiny from independent and within our own institution, bodies, committees, experts, lay people, the works to give us um, the, the green light to go ahead. I can't go ahead without that because that's that they've got my back then legally. Um, it, it's 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 not not legal to do it. So we have followed all of these things and more. We actually sought out the highest level of scrutiny possible using uh, the um, Research Ethics Committee rather than going through another route that we thought might have been simpler because I, I wanted to have the strongest level uh, of uh, essentially scrutiny that, 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 that we could. Um, so we followed all of these laws. The other reason why I think uh, the other thing people might want to know is, of course, we have five travellers who have also looked over all our documentation, read through our plans. We co-designed the questionnaire. So where there were questions that I thought might be useful and they did not want, they didn't think it was appropriate. They, those questions were taken out. Um, so at, at every stage, it was together with our um, Scottish travellers uh, asking them if they 
thought this would fly? Is this what they wanted? Uh, would people want this? Would people find, would this in some way upset people? And, you know, we, we tailored it to suit um, what they wanted. I, uh, I'm not you about... Have a, you have a website up at the moment, and uh, is there an opening closing date? So the study is ongoing at the minute. We're probably going to, I mean, everything costs money, of course, so we can't go on forever. So we'll probably close uh, recruitment in February. So in a, in a couple, well, three months, three or four months. And uh, because then we'll bring it to a close and uh, everyone will have to get their spit samples back by then so that we can then send them away to get the DNA out of them and then to read the letters of the DNA and then to do the analysis and find out um, some of the answers. So there's a website people can look at. It's edacuk, so ed.ac.uk slash traveler genes. And there you can click to learn all about the study. You can register interest. Do you want me to share my screen and show the website? Well, what, I can, what I can do uh, is that I'm going to share all them links in the video when I, when I edit and post it. Ah, uh, yeah. But if you like, you can show us the website. Yeah, we can take a look at it. I know I, I can't share the screen because you started right, the call. Then. Yeah. Okay, then we won't be looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's it's quite a simple website, I hope. It has lots of like FAQs if people want. It has uh, email addresses for people to get in touch with if they have questions. You can register. You, you tell your name and your date of birth you, and your email address. There's an online study. You then get um, an email back, and in that email is a link. You click on that link. It takes you to the consent, then to the questionnaire. And then you're basically finished. Then, then the spit kit comes, you spit in the tube, post it back, done. Quite simple. I think it's, a, look at it, it's an exciting project for many reasons. I think, I hope the Scottish travellers get and understand to a certain degree uh, what they're getting from us. Like if we were to go by the Irish version initially, it was very misrepresentative, we felt, because it was saying, and it wasn't by the scientists, it was the narrative that was missing the cultural narrative or the history narrative, because it was like travelers had broken away or diverged from the settled people in the 1600s, whatever it might have been. And we were saying, no, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't so feel like we came from that world in the first place. So we have obviously all these things, like you were saying earlier about um, uh, genetics and archaeology, both have, I can sympathize with you because both, <laughs> both have been used for evil purposes in the past sometimes. But of course, there's great power in the stories of where people come from. And um, but they but they can also be used for a lot of good. And uh, the studies that were done here, uh, myself and Bernard, I think we are, that's what we're the, some of the projects we're working on. It's exactly that we understand that it's um, we, we think the history sorting out the history is one of the um, and advancing the understanding of the history based on the genetics. And genetics allows us to actually pin our hats on certain uh, narratives that actually might make more sense. Um, you gone again there, yeah. Yeah, I think he has. Yeah, it's an interesting study. Like we're we're uh, hoping for that, getting the picture, getting a picture on the other side, because we have certain story we're putting together, if you know what I mean, and getting a picture, as you know, Jim, on the other side of the channel over there into Scotland would be really interesting because it's going to either, you know, uh, confirm or disconfirm, and e either way, it'll be very helpful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. And from a Scottish point of view, it's a whole strand of Scottish DNA that no one's ever looked at. It's, it's, it's amazing. completely missing. Um, so I, it'll fill in that piece from the Scotland perspective, but then from the traveller perspective, yeah, it's it's filling in a gap, a big... I'm, I'm, sure I'm very your, excited. I'm sure you have your eye on that. Like, even families like Bernard's, for example, are, are, uh, have their legends start in Scotland. So it could be very interesting in that regard, like uh, to find out if we have. Uh... We, could be we could be cousins, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> we, might, we might have to unite the clans, my friend. <laughs> That's it. Uh, Jim, is there any. Um, I suppose it'd be, yeah, because again, the Irish one had the documentary style to go with it. It was meeting and greeting people and they were coming and going and the surprises on their faces. Well, uh, yeah, is, there any plan, is there any plans to do that with the Scottish one? Not at the minute. No, I, we don't have any plans um, to do that. I, I guess I'd have to have an interested TV uh, bunch to, to come and approach us, but not, nothing so far. So, so I was going to, just going to say that when, what you were saying there, Bernard, that um, 
it's it, it's certainly not the it's not the genetic studies genetic studies are genetic studies if you know what i mean and that criticism that bernard was saying about the uh, earlier ones was, was not in any way about the studies it was about how it's interpreted which of course is an ongoing thing that goes on for years afterward as we try to figure out what um, what does this mean and what does that mean and of course it gets refined as more studies are done and we try to piece it but uh, in, in my case of course we're comparing it to the um well it's some of its history but also the archaeological record and where what happened then what happened then what could this be you know what would we expect at certain times so it, it very much advances our picture of, of the past and 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 we're, and as being as me and bernard are very concerned about we in some cases these things are very much it's not just a, of interest in the past but very much of interest in the present moment for communities that find themselves marginalized quite often because their story is not told right or it's been lost or suppressed or whatever has happened in the past and um one prime example on that well, it's, well, it's not important. a prime example but it's an example which always i've given it a few times and i don't know the right proper definitions if there isn't even such a thing as a proper definition because they're all words anywhere according to Noam Chomsky but what was irking me for quite a while with the Irish state was that we got institutionalized segregated condemned because of our cultural traits and this that and the other is that yeah we're here now and in, in the present uh, and we still got these uh, institutional mechanisms in place that are suppressing travelers and um, aggressing against our culture and our identity so we're thinking that are we an ethnic minority as in if you were to take african americans that were taken from the the home continent and they were brought to america now they're classed as an ethnic minority because they're not people from the land now if you were to take mark charles a native american and he's indigenous from the land but he's not called ethnic. But here in Ireland, you got Roma who are ethnic because they came from India. You got Irish travelers by the state have been categorized now as an ethnic minority in the traveler Roma strategy plans. But yet we're saying we're indigenous, not ethnic. Have any thoughts on that, my friend? Any at all? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's the issues of identity are very complicated. Um, geneticists do not decide who's an ethnic minority. Society decides these these things. And uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's quite complicated indeed. I am. Um, I think what genetics can do is that it can tell you, uh, provide a window onto the past that uh, nothing else has recorded because it's living inside us. Uh, as long as someone in the past has descendants today, we can, we can learn about them. So it's, there are stories that only DNA can tell and I hope that we can, we can bring these out. And they're much, I, I, I'm not saying genetics the only way to do it. it. It works the best when you have multiple disciplines and you can put them all together, but there's definitely a strand that only genetics can tell you about. So I hope, I hope that we can, we can do a bit more of that and say what you like, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak with yourself, Jim. I look forward to someday meeting in person when things are well. And as Trav Vision Foundation, I'd be crazy not to put my name forward to do a documentary on the genetics of travelers, but given that we are travelers, uh, how we get the funding to do that is, is another thing. Um, but I leave yourselves to say goodbye and farewells and anything else you'd like to add before you go. I'll let Jim have uh, the last word there. So. <laughs> No, I, I just want to say thank you. I, I've never done a thing like this before, so I was very nervous, but um, I've actually enjoyed it loads. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak and explain my side of things a little bit. And um, yeah, I look forward to the study and uh, also look forward to meeting you in person one day when, when the world is an easier place to, to do that. So thanks very much. <laughs>